Well, a blessed afternoon to you. I want to thank you again for joining us for this afternoon session, this second deposit of information concerning how it is that we sing the Lord's song in a strange land. Once again, I'd like to thank our president, Dr. Jerry Young. I'd like to thank the president of our music and worship arts auxiliary, Dr. Saunders, for providing this opportunity for me to offer words that I pray will be of help, be of inspiration to those who receive it. And I pray that it's simple enough and portable enough that you can share it with other people. Again, I am Haywood Robinson. I have the privilege to serve the People's Community Baptist Church in Silver Spring, Maryland as its pastor for the past 16 years. But I was a music major at Hampton University and began my professional work coming out of college in music education and working with music ministry. And so it's been a blessing during my pastoral work to be able to have music as a backdrop and background to blend with pastoral leadership. Let's look to the Lord and ask him to bless today's session. Our loving Father, we thank you so very much for the opportunity to minister to your people. I pray that you would do as you have done before and do as you're doing through other leaders from around this nation through this virtual annual session. I pray that you would use me as your instrument and accomplish far more than could ever be accomplished through my natural abilities and thus glorify yourself and help us all to better understand how it is that we can sing the Lord's song in this strange land and in this strange season. We bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I pray that you can say amen to that as well. And I'd like to pick up on what we talked about yesterday concerning that same theme, how to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. I'd like for us to give consideration today to the book of Romans chapter 12 beginning at verse number one. Yesterday we looked at Psalm 42 and pulled a few thoughts out of Psalm 42 about the importance of remembering, relying, and rejoicing with respect to our God. Today I'd like to just expand that a little bit in hopes that what we look at in Romans 12 will also aid us in Worshiping the Lord in a weary land, it will aid us in singing his song in a strange land and giving him praise in a parched land. And so Romans chapter 1 reads this way from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. I want to read those same two verses from the message translation, which reads like this. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. 
Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I like both of those translations, and I pray that both renderings have spoken to you. Today, I'd like for us to give some thought to this question of how we can sing the Lord's song in a strange land, in a strange season, I want to use kind of as a topic uh, the words of a book of recent printing, last few years, by Simon Sinek, entitled, It Starts With Why. I want to suggest that no matter how strange the land is, that we find ourselves placed by God's perfect or permissive will, that we find ourselves there in some way to bring him glory. And so the question we need to ask is not simply how can I sing the Lord's song in a strange land, but it starts with why. Why do I sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Why should I? Sing it. It all starts with my why. And so today, I'd like us to give consideration to that. This text tells us to present ourselves before the Lord 100%, to lay ourselves before him, and that that is our spiritual act of worship, that we are to be transformed in our minds so that we don't fit into the squeeze, the mold of this world and become like them. Well, how do we do that? How did the children of Israel, how would they in bondage to Babylon or any other nation, how would they still celebrate the Lord their God in that strange land? How does Paul and Silas, how do they celebrate and worship God in a strange place called the Philippian jail. When persecution broke out early in the book of Acts and the believers were scattered all over the place, how is it that Philip, even out in the desert, could still worship the Lord? How do we do that in a strange place? How did Jesus, even on the cross, offer words of worship to the Father? I want to suggest today that it starts with our why. Why do we sing, period? And so I want to suggest a few thoughts today that I hope will resonate with you so that in this strange season that we're in, this strange land that we're in, this strange space that believers find themselves in, that the nation finds itself in, that the world finds itself in here in 2020. I hope that these few thoughts would help you to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. I hope that these words will help you help others to still sing the Lord's song in a strange land, for he deserves the worship even in the midst of a weary land. The first thing that I want us to consider as a why is the fact that we have relationship with God. That's a huge reason to, to worship him, to sing his song, even when we find ourselves in a dire circumstance physically, 
dire circumstance in our home, in our relationships, dire circumstance in our local communities and churches, he has established a relationship with us that deserves his song to still be sung, even in a strange land. What kind of relationship? Well, we said a little bit about it in yesterday's session. We have a personal relationship with the God who created the heavens and the earth. Who would not sing the Lord's song when you are caused to remember that I have a relationship that, 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 that was established and initiated by him and not by me? What a precious relationship it is. It's a personal relationship, but it's also a purchased relationship relationship. The first 11 chapters of Romans helps us to appreciate all that God allowed and how he established a pattern and set things up so that we could be grafted in and so that we could become a part of his family, so that we could have a personal relationship with God. That's why the, the translations of old say, in view of God's mercy, when we consider his mercy of chapters 1 through 11, listen, present your body as a response to that. Well, what mercy? Well, he redeemed us. He purchased our salvation. Robert Fryson, uh, home with the Lord now, penned that beautiful song that said, Jesus purchased my salvation way back on Calvary's tree. My brothers and sisters, if we can just remember that we have a personal relationship with God, that relationship lasts no matter where we go. It's a purchased relationship, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And as we indicated yesterday, it's a permanent relationship. Nothing, nothing can disrupt that relationship. That's why Paul writes, I am persuaded, persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let's, let us be mindful that our why <clears throat> starts with relationship. I, if, I, if I had no other reason, to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. I could sing it simply because I am his and he is mine. Let me encourage you with another reason, though we probably don't really need any other reason. Relationship is reason enough, but there's some rewards that flow out of the relationship. There are some benefits that flow out of having a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There, there are benefits, there are ramifications, there are rewards that flow out of every relationship that we have. So particularly in this relationship, one of the things that comes out of this relationship, this purchased relationship, is acceptance by God. You know, one of the things that, that, that steals the tongue of many people, they're unable to sing God's praises because they don't quite get it that they are already accepted in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, that we are accepted in the beloved. We're accepted in Jesus Christ. But so many people are on this, this wheel, uh, this, this route of running, trying to please God. And cannot find fulfillment in life because they feel like they never quite measure up. The truth is we don't measure up. The scripture says in Romans chapter 3 that we all come short of the glory of God. That, that we're all, that, that none is righteous, no not one. And so since we can't measure up, we take, take delight in the fact that Jesus paid it all that he measured up, that he is the standard by which we now can be measured, that we are be dressed, as one of the hymnologists wrote, dressed in his righteousness. Oh, beloved, thank God we're accepted 
That's a reward that's ours out of the relationship. Not only do we have acceptance by God, but get this, we have access to God. When we're in a strange place, we may not have access to the things we're used to, the people we're used to. The, the restaurants, the, the, the resources, the banks. We may not have access to the, the, the education and the teachers and the ministers and the friends that we're used to. We're, we're isolated now. We, we don't come together on Sundays like we once used to. We don't have access to one another as we once did. But guess what? We still have access to God. Not even the coronavirus could block that access. Not the injustices uh, perpetuated upon us over the years uh, are able to, to separate us from being able to have access to God. That's why our foreparents, even under the burden of slavery, could still sing over my head. I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere. They were able to sing about this great God because they knew that even the pain of slavery could not disrupt the relationship they had with God. So they have access to God. We have access to God. We have acceptance by God. But the other thing that's a reward of ours through this relationship is that we have assistance from God. Sure, we've got to navigate our way through this strange territory. We've got to make our way, press our way through this unfamiliar terrain. But the good news of the gospel is we don't have to do it alone. Because God, this omnipresent God we talked about yesterday, he's with us everywhere we go. Jesus shared with his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, Lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. And so as we go, as we make our way, as we come to forks in the road and have to figure out what to do next, we have assistance from God himself. We have the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I will send you another comforter, meaning one of the same quality, one of the same type, and he will lead you in all truth. Aren't you so glad that no matter where we land, whatever strange place we find ourselves in, the Holy Ghost is right there with us. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, resident in us. We've got it made, my brothers and sisters. Is it difficult? Sure. But we can manage the difficulties because we have an eternal assistant who knows the landscape who can see the end from the beginning. My brothers and sisters, it starts with why. Why sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Well, we sing it because of a relationship that we did not deserve. We sing it because of a relationship that was purchased for us. And out of that relationship, there are some rewards. There are some benefits that we have acceptance and access and assistance from this great God. I thank the Lord that we have a, a why to sing even in a strange land. And the why kind of dictates the how. How do we do it? Well, we do it as we think about the relationship and think about the rewards. And when we think about the reasons, what are some of the reasons that God would even arrange such a relationship with wretches like us, with, with people who are prone to wander, as the songwriter said. As the scripture says that we all like sheep have gone astray. What would cause God to want to offer the blood of his own son on behalf of those who are, are bent on rebellion? And yet he did it for us. The reasons that he has done this should give us a cause to sing his song even when we find ourselves in a very uncomfortable place. Well, what are those reasons? Well, I want to suggest that one of the reasons is that he designed me for relationship. 
You go all the way back to the creation of man in the Garden of Eden. God created everything by speaking it. He spoke light into being. He spoke plant life into being. He spoke vegetation into being. He spoke animal life into being. He spoke the birds into being. He spoke everything into being. But when it came to man, oh, he didn't speak us into being because he wanted a different kind of relationship. He put his hands in it. He got down and began to, to kneel, as, as, as James Weldon Johnson says, he, that, that he began to mold out of that clay a shape of a man and then blew into that man the breath of life. He blew him, his own essence into us. Why? Because he wanted relationship. He designed us to communicate with him. He designed us to reflect him and to represent him we thank God that he designed us for relationship. I thank God that not only did he design us that way, but he desires relationship. When Adam and Eve blew it, when they, when they stumbled and fell and crossed the line and, dis, and ruptured the relationship, my brothers and sisters, God spared no expense to try to repair it. He expelled them from the Garden of Eden so that he, they would not get locked in eternally into that broken state. And then he provided laws and he provided prophets. He provided ways in which we might be carved out at his people and be guided in the proper way of life. But even with our rebellion, he knew that eventually he would have to come down himself. So he sent his son through 40 and two generations and his son gave his life, died on Calvary, but he could not, would not stay dead. He got up on Sunday morning and broke the bands of death and he broke the, the power of the grave so that you and I now can have eternal life with him. Why? Because he's always desired relationship with us. And so we're designed for relationship. Because of his desire for our relationship, we should sing. And because of his devotion to us for relationship, we ought to sing. He was devoted enough to give up his son. John 3.16 tells us God what? So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God is devoted to us. So we ought to sing. Even when we're in a strange place, even when we don't understand what's going on, we know that the God who oversees us understands and he sees what's going on and perhaps we'll understand it better by and by. But in the meantime, we sing, as the songwriter said, because we're happy. We'll sing because we're free. His eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. Brothers and sisters, we've got some reasons, some good reasons to, to bless the Lord, to worship the Lord, even in a place of hardship. When we think about the relationship that we have with him, when we think about the rewards that flow out of that relationship, and when we think about the reasons why we're privileged with such a precious relationship, then it leads to our response. You see, worship is really a response. Listen to what John Piper says about what worship is. The inner essence of worship is the response of the heart to the knowledge of the mind when the mind is rightly understanding God and the heart is rightly valuing God. So when we rightly understand him and when we rightly value him, there is a natural response. That's why this text says that worship is our reasonable service. It's a natural reaction. It's a natural response to the goodness of the Lord. How do we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Well, we think ourselves happy. We think about the goodness of the Lord. We reflect upon who he is and reflect upon who we are and that we have this unmerited 
relationship with him that cannot be severed, that cannot be terminated, that cannot be ended, that he has established it for eternity and let us know that the best of that relationship is yet to come. Oh, we have a response for him and because he, he died on Calvary for us, our response ought to be individual and that's what I believe this COVID experience has helped us to appreciate. Some of us only would give him a response when we gathered at the church house but now when nobody's watching when there's nobody who we can try to impress with our praise no we've got to sing the song at home we've got to sing the song by ourselves it's an individual response and I want to encourage you that even in the midst of this seminar if you take a moment and think about how good God has been to you what he spared you from what he's brought you through and what he's brought you to you too too, ought to just think yourself happy, ought to wave your hand and ought to stomp your feet because it's a natural response, the individual response of the individual who's been blessed. But it's also an independent response. You ought not need any manipulation. You see, there are some of us who, who have found ourselves worshiping God because the music helped us worship. The right Hammond organist helped us to worship. The right groove of the bass guitar helped us to worship. The music and, and the right tune and hum of the preacher helped us to worship. But now we've been reminded that no, 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 we don't need any of those props. We don't need any of those supports. In a strange land, you got to have your own basis, your own why. And so we've got to say, Lord, I'm independent. I'm not worshiping you because my neighbor's worshiping you. I'm not worshiping you simply because of what you're doing for me today. I can remember what you brought me through and what, how you brought me over. I can remember how you made a way out of no way. So the songwriter said, you know, how I got over, how I got over. My soul looks back in wonder how I got over. So we ought to give him some independent celebration. Sing the song independently. When nobody else is there, no harmony no accompaniment. You be your own accompaniment. Put your hands together and stomp your feet and give him the praise that he so deserves from each one of us. And then our response has to be intentional. You see, there ought not be any accidental response when we think about this relationship. There ought to be no accidental response when we think about all the rewards that are ours, the benefits that we enjoy because of this relationship. When we think about the reasons that he designed us to be with him, that he desires us to be with him. When we consider that he had devotion for us to be with him so that he paved the way uh, by way of his son's blood, then my brothers and sisters, we ought to be intentional about worshiping him. In other words, may not feel like him, my muscles may be aching, may not be feeling the best, but I'm going to worship him on purpose, going to lift him up on purpose, going to sing his song on purpose. My brothers and sisters, we've just got to give him what he deserves on purpose. Worship is an intentional thing. It never happens accidentally. Very often it's spontaneous. I remember my mother used to wave her hand often. It, it was embarrassing to me as a 13 year old or 14 year old while my dad was preaching how her hand would just go up and she would just say whoo but you know what? As I grew older and I started having my own challenges, I began to understand why that hand would go up. Because something that he said triggered a remembrance of some good thing God did for her. And as she remembered it, she could not help but respond. That's what worship is. Listen, I want to encourage you to worship the Lord as a genuine, intentional, independent, individual response to your realization, to your remembrance that you have a personal relationship with God and no desert can block it. No famine can block it. That, that, that nothing can cause us to no longer have that relationship. So we sing because we're happy. We sing because we're free. God's eye is on the sparrow. We know that he watches over me. And one of these days when our journey is over down here, we'll be able to gather with him up yonder and begin to sing all hail the power of Jesus name let angels prostrate fall we'll be able to sing that hallelujah glory and honor he brought me all the way aren't you glad that he will have brought you all the way brothers and sisters 
Worship in the spirit of holiness. Father, we thank you for the privilege to worship you, to sing your song in a strange land. Thank you that you've given us a why, the relationship, the rewards. And we thank you, oh, Father, for the reasons. So receive our response today. We give it to you freely in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for the opportunity. I pray that you will be blessed.